All right, Daniel, I believe it's 5.30. Um, I, I think we're still waiting on one subcommittee member, but um, if you want to go ahead and call the meeting to order, um, we can get going. Okay. Um, so we're gonna call this meeting to order of the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners, Commissioners Mule Deer Enhancement Oversight uh, Committee or the uh, uh, Lincoln County Subcommittee. Um, we're gonna be discussing management areas 22, 23, and 24 within Lincoln County. Um, this is Wednesday, April 7th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. Um, so we called the meeting to order. Um, our first action or four possible action is, a, oh, yeah. One second, Daniel. So I would like to start off with um, making sure, um, start with introductions and a brief description of who you represent and making sure and signifying that each subcommittee member is present at the meeting. So first off, I will start with Bill Brown. He's here, I'm answering for him because he's driving. Hey, thank you he's, so much. Uh, a, he's farmer and rancher, I guess. Thank you. Okay, and then we'll go to Cameron Boyce. Yeah, uh, Cameron Boyce, Bureau of Land Management, County Field Office, and I'm the Assistant Field Manager. Okay, um, Dane Bradfield. So I believe that's who I thought was missing from the panelists list. Um, well, next we'll go to Mark Holt. Okay, and then Ruben Rowe. What are you looking for again, Joe? Just a brief introduction and who you represent on this team. Uh, Ruben Rao, a uh, sportsman for Lincoln County. All right, thank you so much, Ruben. And then I would like to introduce myself. My name is Joe Bennett. I'm the supervisory game biologist for the Southern Region, and I'll be just helping to facilitate this meeting, and then I'll hand it back over to Daniel. Okay, hello, everybody. I'm Daniel Slee. I'm the uh, game biologist um, for Lincoln County out of Panaca. Um, I'm relatively new here, just been in the position for about two months. Um, and before I was here, I've been working on a master's degree at Brigham Young University over in Provo. Um, so I'm excited to be here and working with all of you. Um, so now for possible action. I guess um, I apologize for interjecting again. Let's let our Habitat representatives who are also a member of the subcommittee introduce okay. themselves. I apologize for that oversight. Um, we'll start with Mariah Colada or Colada. Mariah Colada, I'm a habitat biologist. I'm based out of Healy, um, but I cover part of Lincoln County as well. Okay, and then Tracy Kipke. Uh, you might be on the wrong mic. Can you hear me, Joe? Okay, um, I'm Tracy Kipke. I'm the habitat and mining biologist for um, Lincoln County. And I um, am based in Las Vegas and I've been with Indow for about 14 years. Okay, and then Brad Hardenbrook. I'm Brad Hardenbrook. I'm a supervisory habitat biologist for Department of Wildlife stationed in Las Vegas, and I've been with the department for, well, since 1989. Perfect. All right, Daniel, sorry about that. Okay, so now um, we have a, for possible action, approval of the agenda. The subcommittee re will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The subcommittee may remove items from the agenda 
combine items for consideration or take items out of order. Um, since this is for possible action, we'll be now going to a three minute period for public comment. Um, if you have public comment, you can um, send your comments to, oh, what was the email? Endowgame at endow.org. Oh, there it is, yeah, endowgame at endow.org. That's N-D-O-W-G-A-M-E at N-D-O-W dot org. So you have three minutes to get your public comments in. All right, I believe that's been three minutes. Um, Joe, is there any public comment? I am not seeing any public comment on the agenda. Okay, since there's no public comment on the agenda, we're going to um, take it out for action. Or, or, or a motion. Oh, for a motion, sorry. Yeah, we'll take it out for a motion. Joe, are you just looking for a motion to uh, close the public comment? Is that what you're looking for? To approve the agenda, since it's a possible action item. Was that agenda sent out on email? I was just looking. I just couldn't find a copy of it. I believe it was sent out as an email. Sent out to each individual, I believe.
and Daniel or Mariah or Tracy, um, anybody on the team or the subcommittee could provide the motion as well. Oh, okay. I can provide the motion then? Yeah, and the, um, the agenda is also on the website if you're having trouble finding it, Ruben. Okay, so. I found it. So I can propose a motion to uh, fix, approve the agenda. And looking for a second. I'll second. Thank you. Um, so now for possible action, the report on the Mulder Enhancement Program. The subcommittee will view presentations on the status and history of mule deer in area 22, 23, 24, in 27, the challenges facing those herds, the mule deer enhancement plan limiting factor ranking and project identification process. Following the presentation, the subcommittee will discuss any comments and questions. The subcommittee may take action to provide direction to staff or establish findings or recommendations to present to the mule deer enhancement oversight committee. So now I believe we'll go into that presentation, correct Joe? Okay, and I'll be giving that presentation. So, let me share my screen. Do you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes, okay. Um, so just before I get started, um, for those of you viewing this um, presentation uh, just on one screen, there'll be a window that has like all of our uh, cameras and stuff. So if you need to move that around to see more information on the slides, you can do that. You can also minimize um, the video portion or the, yeah, the, that window with the videos to see um, the slides better. So, uh, Let's get into this presentation. So first we wanna talk about the intent of this program. Um, the Mule Deer Enhancement Program is a team process intended to identify the major limiting factors impacting uh, mule deer and guide efforts in improving and maintaining mule deer populations and habitat. So we wanna identify and prioritize limiting factors for perform needs assessments for addressing each factor and develop outcomes to monitor. So that's the overall goal of this program. So first we want to discuss a little bit about mule deer biology. Um, I know a lot of people on this meeting are, um, have a pretty good understanding of mule deer biology. Uh, we just wanted to give a brief overview. So as you all know, mule deer are a browsing species, uh, meaning their diet consists mainly of shrubby material, including sagebrush, bitterbrush, um, snowberry, even oak brush in some portions of Lincoln County. Um, and when they're eating um, shrub material, they have a preference for younger plants and new, new growth that's more succulent and palatable for them. Um, forbs and grasses are also important during certain portions of the year, particularly during the spring and early summer when that growing period occurs. Um, for those of you who don't know, forbs are um, just small non-woody plants, wildflowers, things like that. Um, so those can make up a pretty good portion of the diet during some portions of the year. Um, but like we said, mule deer are shrub reliant, uh, meaning they require healthy shrub, for, shrub forb habitat um, to sustain themselves, particularly through the winter. Um, bitter brush um, can be pretty important for them to make it through the winter in Lincoln County. They also um, benefit from patchy vegetation cover across the landscape. Um, that means that they need some structural components to their habitat, um, primarily for thermal cover in the winter um, to get up under shrubs and trees to, um, for more warmth or shade cover in the summer, other things like that. Also hiding cover from predators also plays into um, the patchy vegetation cover they require. And mule deer in Lincoln County are seasonal migrants, meaning they have a distinct um, difference between their summer and winter ranges. In some areas, that can be just a short elevational migration down from the tops of the mountains down to the lower foothills, 
or um, in some areas such as management area 22 and 23 can have longer distance migrations uh, from, from summer areas to winter areas. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of mule deer in Nevada. This graph here on the right depicts um, estimated population levels from around 1870 uh, to around two the year 2000. This information was gathered from historic records kept um, in uh, yeah, historic records found by settlers coming west, ranchers establishing areas and more recently uh, data that we have gathered. So you can see a few distinct trends or yeah, trends on this graph. The first being prior to European settlement. So in the late 1800s, all the way through the early 1900s, mule deer were really not prevalent throughout Nevada. They occurred at really low levels and really low densities. When European settlement started to occur throughout the state, we saw changes um, to habitat, habitat alterations. And um, that would just be settlers coming, uh, using timber for building houses, establishing mines and other things. They really opened up habitat and allowed that shrub component of the habitat to increase, which in turn allowed the mule deer population to expand pretty substantially as we can see. In the mid 1900s, we can see that around 1950, 1960, we can see a pretty precipitous decline in mule deer population numbers. That was, that coincides um, with poor weather conditions. There could have been pretty harsh winters followed by drought conditions that really drove the population down. Also, there could have been changes in the land use practices, um, could have been overuse of the landscape and other things that just put those mule deer in relatively poor condition and set them up to be vulnerable to extreme weather events. We uh, saw another pretty substantial increase in the 70s and 80s. Um, that would be due to favorable, favorable weather conditions leading to um, conditions that allowed mule deer to expand in population and had high survival and high recruitment. Then in around 1993, we had a pretty harsh winter um, there were pretty severe low temperatures coupled with above average snowfall, which all led to a pretty substantial decline. And ever since then, we've been in some pretty significant drought cycles that have kept the mule deer population at levels below the highs observed in the 80s. So we're going to discuss mule deer within management areas 22, 23, 24 and 27. Uh, we say management areas in Lincoln County because these are L Lincoln County. I'm in Lincoln County and this is where we manage, the, this is where I'm based out of for managing these populations. But we do recognize that uh, portions of area 22 are in White Pine County and the entirety of unit 272, portions of 271 and 243 are within Clark County. So we recognize members of the public might be viewing this from those other counties. And we just encourage you to participate in the, pro uh, in the process, provide public comment, and just work with us to talk about mule deer management within these units that we all have a vested interest in. So we're gonna discuss management area 22 first. So this is a graph depicting the population estimates for mule deer in management area 22. Uh, can you guys see my mouse on the screen? Yes, okay, cool. I was trying to make that a red laser pointer, but I can't figure out how to do that at the moment. Um, but we can see a few things from this population estimate. First of all, um, it mirrored the pretty substantial increase in the 70s through the mid 80s. That was due to favorable weather conditions like we discussed leading to high fawn ratios and high recruitment. We also had the implementation of the hunt quota system implemented in the mid seventies, which restricted harvest on mule deer populations and allowed them to expand to these higher levels. Then in that 19, 
93 area, we had really, really tough winter, um, high levels of snow, really low winter temperatures, which caused a pretty significant decline. And ever since then, the population has been at this lower level um, due to a system of drought cycles, severe drought cycles that we've had that haven't allowed the mule deer population to increase to levels we've seen it at before. So I have added the black line remains the population estimate with time on the x-axis and number of deer on the y-axis. So we've added two lines to this. The green one is our fall sample size. Um, so this, it, these are numbers that we have counted during um, the fall period. We try to time those surveys with red right around rut activity to get a good post hunt estimate of the deer that are out there. We get fawn to doe ratios, which show an indicator of um, recruitment um, and fawn survival through the summer and what could potentially um, recruit into the adult population. And we also get buck to doe ratios, uh, which are a measure, which are what we manage these populations for is our buck to doe ratios. So that um, we try to time this as, as close after the hunt and during the red activity as possible to get as accurate numbers as we can. The blue dotted line is the spring sample size. So we surveyed these populations again coming out of winter to get an estimate of the fawn to adult ratio. Uh, this is different than the fawn to doe ratio in the fall because bucks have lost their antlers and we can't easily distinguish them from does. So we get a fawn to doe ratio, or sorry, fawn to adult ratio as a measure of how fawn survived through the winter and what we can expect to be recruited into the adult population. A couple noteworthy things, um, you can see some gaps in the sample sizes. That's just because we weren't able to sample during those years for weather, um, lack of personnel, other reasons. Um, so we use the, the um, sample size from the sample from these fall and spring surveys to put in the population models to model our population. So now the black line remains the population estimate. Time is again on our x-axis. This y-axis is the population estimate. And I've added these blue bars, which are the total precipitation um, received during the area. The axis for that is here on the right. Um, it's annual precipitation in inches. And we can see a few interesting trends in this data. So if you see multiple areas uh, or multiple years with above average precipitation, those tend to lead to periods of increased growth, uh, population growth. And then years of drought conditions with below average precipitation can um, be followed by decreases in mule deer populations. You can see it here in the 90s and here um, in around 2010, we had a drought cycle. One thing we can also notice here is we had several years of drought preceding the severe winter of 1993. So we do see above average precipitation here, but most of that fell during the winter, coupled with pretty cold temperatures, um, which led to a, the population decline. This uh, bar graph is um, our harvest. So again, time in years is on the x-axis and the y-axis is the total number of deer harvested. The orange portion of the lines are the buck harvest and the purple portion of the lines or the bars is the antlerless harvest. So that'd be doe harvest. As you can see in the eighties, we had pretty, um, we had some higher doe harvest um, because the populations were at really high levels and they could support doe harvest to get that opportunity out there. Uh, after the pretty severe winter of 93, we stopped harvest, we stopped hunting does in management area 22. You can see starting in 1999, there is minimal doe harvest um, that we had, and that is uh, driven by the junior hunting tags. Um, juniors can harvest either a doe or a buck. So the doe component of the harvest from 1999 onward is the youth harvesting does. All right, Daniel, real quick, let me interrupt you. It's been yeah. come to my attention that we didn't take a vote on the agenda. Oh. You made the motion and seconded it. So if you can remake that motion and take it out to vote, just so we can make sure we're doing everything correctly, I appreciate it. 
Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Um, so I make a motion to approve the agenda. I will second. And can we get a vote? Aye. Aye. And any against? Okay. The motion passes unanimous, unanimously. Thank you, Daniel. You can please proceed. Okay. Um, so just for a little recap, we just uh, discussed the buck and doe portion of the harvest and management area 22. Now we have this graph. So this black line is what we've been seeing as the population estimate. And the orange line is total deer harvest. As you can see, um, we harvest these deer at a level that's very, that's pretty far below the estimated deer population. So we have a relatively conservative harvest structure um, in Management Area 22 and throughout Nevada. So now I've overlaid the sample sizes, the spring and fall sample sizes, as we discussed earlier, on top of the, um, the total harvest. So as you can see, we try to get sample sizes pretty high above the harvest. And this, remember this um, green line represents the buck to doe ratio, or we get the buck to doe ratio after the harvest to see um, what bu a buck to doe ratio that remains af after the hunts have already taken place. So this next graph is the modeled buck to doe ratio for a management area 22. This is an all uh, alternative management unit. So we try to manage for a slightly higher buck to doe ratio than the majority of the state. The management objective is between 30 to 40 bucks per 100 does. We try to aim for the 35. And as you can see, over the long term, um, our average buck to doe ratio is 34. And in the past 20 years or so, we've been consistently higher than that at the upper end of that buck to doe ratio. A uh, few things about the buck to doe ratio I wanted to mention. First of all is um, when you start appro approaching a buck to doe ratio below 10 bucks per 100 does, you can start seeing reduced reproduction throughout your mule deer herd because the buck density on the landscape is not sufficient enough to get to all the does when they're reproductively receptive. So that's one biological sideboard we want to stay pretty far away from is that lower than 10 bucks per 100 does ratio that leads to reduced reproduction. There's also an upper level of uh, buck to doe ratio. Anywhere above around 50 bucks per 100 does or so can start um, having, the bucks can start reducing the resources out there available for fawns. So you can see lower fawn survival or even lower reproduction um, at a pretty extremely, pretty relatively extremely high buck to doe ratios, 50 or above. So this next graph, the black line has remained our buck to doe ratio. Um, our X axis is time. Our Y axis is bucks per hundred does or fawns per hundred does. So this um, green line, is the fawn to doe ratio. Over the long term, it's been around 54 fawns per 100 does. And that we get a, a so let's go over the spring fawn to doe ratio too before we discuss. So this orange line is the spring fawn to adult ratio we get from our uh, spring surveys. And over the long term, it's been around 37. So for an Increase for a stable or increasing population, we try to get our fawn to doe ratios above around 30. Um, that's a good indicator that your population is going to stay the same. About well above 30 um, shows increase, and in the 20s and below 20 shows your population is likely declining. So, a couple of things I wanted to point out during the late 70s through the 80s, we had pretty high fawn to doe ratios and fawn to adult ratios. That coincided with the large population estimates we saw um, in our total population graph. And then again, in the last five years, we've been pretty well below the average for this population. That's primarily due to the drought cycle we're in now, which we'll discuss a little bit later in this presentation. 
So now this next graph is the percent of the harvest that is a four point buck or better. Time is on the X axis and the percent of harvest four point or better is on the Y axis. So over the long term, our average has been about 31% of the harvest has been four points or better. One noteworthy thing is since around 2005, we have been almost always above that average of 31%. So as the four point or better goes up, um, that indicates that people are harvesting more mature animals and more quality animals um, in this unit. So now we're gonna discuss uh, management area 23, um, which lies almost entirely within Lincoln County. So this is the population estimate. Time is on the x-axis and the y-axis is the population estimate. One thing that stands out between area 23 and area 22 is during the 80s um, and early 90s, we don't see that large um, population estimate. That could be because we could have been underestimating the population back then um, due to our modeling process. Um, and there's a few indicators that we'll go over in the next few slides to show that we were likely underestimating the population back in the um, 80s, but we'll also show why um, in recent times we feel like our population estimate is more accurate and more accurately represents uh, the deer population in this area. So again, the green line is our fall sample size and the blue dotted line is our spring sample size. Um, so one thing you'll notice is in the 80s and early 90s, the uh, distance between our population estimate and the sample sizes is not very big, um, particularly here in spring of around 92 or so. Uh, looks like we sampled around somewhere around 1800 animals and our population, population estimate was only around 23 to 2400 animals. So when we sample populations, we do it from a helicopter aerially looking through the areas for animals. And we know that we don't see all of the animals. We know we don't see nearly all of the animals. So the distance between our population estimate and our sample sizes here indicates that we were likely underestimating the population at this time. That, um, and, uh, so in contrast to that, um, over here in recent years, there's a pretty good gap between our fall sample size, spring sample size, and the population estimate. So that's why we feel like we have a more accurate representation of this population now as opposed to um, in the past. I have overlaid the precipitation, uh, these blue bars over the population estimate. Again, precipitation, uh, the axis for precip precipitation is here on the right. It's in inches and annually. So another reason we feel like we might've been underestimating this population is because during this um, severe drought conditions followed by the severe winter of 1993, 92, we don't see a pretty strong decline in the population. So other areas of Lincoln County and other areas throughout the state had that decline. So that's why we feel like we were underestimating the population back then. So this is the uh, total harvest um, through 1997 through current, uh, the total number of deers on the x-axis here. And again, the orange portion of these bars is the buck harvest. The purple is the doe harvest. So back in the 80s, we had pretty substantial doe harvest. Um, yeah, which we tr uh, was done during, times of high, high population levels that can sustain that harvest. And this doe portion of the harvest since 1999 and forward is from the youth um, hunting tags. 
Here is our population estimate with the total deer harvest below. So again, just highlighting the conservative nature of our harvest strategy. There's a pretty good gap between um, the total number of deer we're harvesting and our estimated population size. We've added the fall sample size and spring sample size on top of that for reference. So I'll give you a second to look at that before going on. Yeah, you will notice that there were some periods where we missed our samples. Um, and that's why we use uh, mathematical models to model our population. So if there are periods where we can't get to sampling for whatever reason, we can still get a pretty good general idea of what the population is doing, even though we didn't sample it, as long as we get samples um, in the future. So here's our model buck to doe ratio for management area 23. The long-term average is uh, right around 34 bucks per 100 does. The management objective for this unit is reflective of most of the state. We're trying to manage for 25 to 35 bucks per 100 does. And we're trying to target that 30 buck per 100 doe number. Um, so this contrasts to area 23 like we saw where the management objective is uh, we target 35. And as you can see, over a long-term average, we've been at the higher end of our management objective and we exceeded it in the past. We have added in green, the fall fawn to doe ratio and in orange, the spring fawn to adult ratio on top of our black buck to doe ratio, which we just discussed. Um, so as you can see in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, we had higher levels of um, fawn to does and fawn to adults than we have now, which is another good indicator that reproduction was high, recruitment was high, so that population was likely higher um, than what we had modeled. But now, over the last five years, um, and even 10 years before that, um, including this year, we've been below average for our uh, fall fawn to doe ratio and our spring fawn to adult ratio. Um, due to the drought cycle that we're in. We're now going to look at this graph of the percent of harvest that is four point or better. So as you can see over the long term, our average has been 46% of the harvest has been four point or better. And since around 2000, we've been uh, consistently above that and sometimes substantially above that. Uh, this is a little bit unique relative to other units that are managed at 30 bucks per hundred does. And one thing that is unique about Area 23 in general is there's a lot of agricultural land that the deer use during certain times of year, particularly during the winter. Um, so those landowners are compensated for the mule deer use on their land through depredation tags. And people that get these depredation tags expend a little bit more resources to get these tags. And a majority of, the, of these people are from out of state. So they tend to put more effort into um, harvesting a uh, mule deer and harvesting a good quality mule deer. They could even get guides to help them. So they expend more effort um, on these landowner depredation tags. So we feel like that drives up the percent four points or better um, harvest in management area 23. So now we're going to discuss management area 24. Um, most of it's in Lincoln County, but like we said, there's some portion of uh, Unit 243 in Clark County. So we know Clark County has a vested interest in this as well. We're gonna start uh, with our mule deer population trend, or yeah, our estimate, sorry, um, like we discussed before. As you can see, this population um, has been modeled pretty well. In the 80s, we had our higher numbers than we do now. Um, those numbers were higher because of the favorable weather conditions we had, the high fawn to doe ratios and recruitment we had and the implementation of the quota system in 1997, or sorry, 1975, um, like we discussed earlier. And we also see in that 93 severe winter followed by um, drought conditions led to a substantial de decrease in this population. And ever since then, we've been growing a little bit, but not, not at levels that we have seen previously um, due to extended drought cycles. We've added the fall sample size and the spring sample size on top of this. For reference, um, 
there were some several periods in a row where we missed sampling. Um, but like I said, that's why we sample two times. Uh, we try to get two samples during a year and we use our mathematical models to estimate the population so we can still get a general idea of what the population is doing, even if we haven't sampled that uh, during any particular year. So now we have overlaid the precipitation like we've done before on top of the population estimate. Again, the precipitation is uh, measured annually in inches. And we can see some of those same cycles we discussed. Um, periods of several years of above average precipitation tend to be followed by increases in the mule deer population, whereas several years of below average precipitation or drought conditions leads to decrease. We see it um, in the 90s, as we have discussed. We can also kind of see it um, in this uh, uh, right around 2010 or so. Um, we didn't have a really good uh, decrease necessarily, but we did see that the population was estimated to be an increase and then it flatlined during that period of drought. And just another noteworthy thing, I think I failed to mention on the other ones, the precipitation um, in 2020 was severely reduced relative to previous years. We're going to go over the uh, harvest component again. So the orange portion of these lines is the buck harvest. The purple portion is the doe harvest. Um, looks like we only had one year or so in the 80s where we had a more aggressive doe hunt. And then again, everything 1999 and forward um, is just due to the youth harvest of does. We have added the uh, population estimate on top of the total deer harvest graph. And as you can see, we're just again highlighting the conservative harvest strategy we use throughout the state. And we've overlaid the population estimates on top of that. Just give you guys a second to look at this. Okay, and now we're going to move on. We're going to talk about the model buck to doe ratio in management area 24. This is another alternate, alternate unit um, that we try to manage for 35 bucks per 100 doe objective, so higher than other areas in the state. And as you can see, over the long term, we have been at the upper end of our management objective, particularly since the year 2000, we have, uh, we have exceeded the 40 buck per 100 doe uh, objective that we have set. And like I said, when we get into that 50 bucks per 100 does or above, we might see some reduced um, reproductive potential in this herd due to forage limited for um, fawns. We have added the fall fawn to doe ratio in green and the spring fawn to adult ratio in orange. Similar trends to other years. Um, in the 80s, we had really high fawn to doe ratios, really high recruitment into the adult population. And in the recent years, we have seen below average um, recruitment due to drought conditions. We're going to look at the graph of the four point percent of the harvest is four point or better. Over the long term, it's been 55% of the harvest has been four point or better. And ever since around 2000, we've exceeded that consistently. And last year, uh, we had about 80% of the harvest is four point or better, which is very high. Um, so people are getting really high quality and sure bucks out of this unit pretty consistently. Now we're gonna talk about management area 27 which um, the entirety of management area or unit 272 is within Clark County as we've discussed before. So uh, area 27 is also unique in that the deer population is pretty low um, and deer are distributed pretty sparsely across the landscape um, down there. It is in a transitional zone to the Mojave Desert ecotype. So um, yeah, it just doesn't support the levels of mule deer and as in other portions of um, uh, the other units that we've discussed. So due to that, we don't survey this population aerially, aerially from a helicopter like we do the other ones. We, um, we manage this one based on demand and hunter success. So 
this graph looks different than ones we've seen before. The blue line is the percent of harvest that is four point or better. Um, and one thing you'll notice is uh, there's valleys and troughs in this, like one year it'll be high, one year it'll be low. That is primarily just driven due to the small number of tags in this area. So since there's not very many people hunting out there, one or two people getting um, a four point can, or not getting a four point can really drive that um, metric up or down. And this orange line is the percent hunter success. Um, I just wasn't able to easily find hunter success for the uh, before around 2010 or so. We were hunting this area and that um, information exists. I just wasn't able to find it in a timely manner. So we try to manage uh, our management objective for area 27 is we try to get greater than 45% success um, for people hunting in this area. Over the long term, we've only been at around 41% and just a few years in the past, we have hit our management objective. And that's really reflective of the low deer densities in the area. Uh, we don't feel like we're over harvesting them to drive success down. It's just their mule deer are pretty sparse and difficult to find throughout uh, management area 27. So now we're gonna discuss um, mule deer populations declines that we have seen throughout Nevada and portions of the West. So you've noticed in all of the areas where we estimate our populations, back in the eighties, we had a lot of mule deer. Now we don't have as many. Um, so we're gonna talk about factors that have led to those declines and that continue to keep the level at below what we've seen in the past. Um, factors that contribute to that that we'll discuss um, next is drought, habitat degradation, utilization by feral horses and domestic livestock, and human influences that threaten the area in Lincoln County. So we're going to start by discussing drought um, in Lincoln County and Nevada. So this map is a drought index for Nevada during the year of 2020, so um, the year we just got done with. One thing you'll notice is the entire state of Nevada is in a level of moderate drought or higher. You can see Lincoln County down here and all of Clark County is in exceptional drought conditions. Um, so we received, Lincoln County received about 30 per, 38% of the average annual precipitation. So we had really severe drought conditions last year. This graph, you got time on the x-axis from 2000 through 2021. And then on the y-axis, we have the percent of the state of Nevada in a drought condition. So up here at 100% would be a reflective of the map we just saw. 100% of the state was in a drought condition. And last year, it looks like about 30% of the state was in severe drought conditions. So as you can see, since 2000, we've had drought cycle after drought cycle after drought cycle, and we're entering another drought cycle. There have been very few years of reprieve from that drought. So this is one of the leading causes of why we haven't been able to get mule deer populations up to levels that were seen in the 80s is because the weather hasn't allowed the resource to be available. We're next going to talk about habitat degradation through pinion and juniper encroachment. So um, as you all probably know, pinion and juniper trees are native to the area. Um, they occur here um, naturally, but there have been alterations to fire frequency and also drought conditions have allowed pinion and juniper to expand across the landscape um, in areas that didn't occur, or in a way that didn't happen historically. So as pinion and juniper stands expand, you get reduced shrub, forb, and grass cover. All of you have probably noticed this um, when you've been out and about. If you get to an area where there's sparse pinion and juniper trees, it's pretty early in the successional stage of that stand. So when the trees first get there, they don't really influence um, the vegetation much, but as the stand matures, the trees mature, become more dense, you'll notice that shrubs start to die off, grasses and forbs start to die off. That's um, primary, that can be due to shading, direct shading from the trees, but also pinion and juniper, um, there's chemical changes that occur in the soil that discourage growth of vegetation that's not pinion and juniper. So as the stands mature, 
they reduce shrub form and grass cover, which leads to increased soil erosion, um, reduced forage for native animals, including mule deer. This picture in the background you can see is more of a mature stage pinion and juniper stand and anywhere there's not trees, there's just open soil. And that can be, um, yeah, that is what occurs in late stage pinion and juniper stands. This is a map of all the management areas we've just been discussing. And this green color is pinion and juniper um, stands. This is from satellite imagery. It's a little coarse, um, but this gives you an idea of almost 75% or so of management area 23 is covered in pinion and juniper. And this is in stark contrast to what it has been historically. If you would look back at this um, 20 to 50 years ago, years ago or so, um, there would be a lot less pinion and juniper on this graph and it would be restricted to an elevational band. And as you can see now, it's expanding both upper elevation and lower elevation. We're next gonna discuss habitat changes through fire. So fire is, can be a double-edged sword in a lot of cases. Um, so we just got done talking about pinion and juniper encroachment. One of the reasons pinion and juniper has expanded is because uh, the fire frequencies have been reduced. So fires haven't come through the sagebrush step juniper or pinion juniper interfaces to uh, kill back the pinion and juniper trees and allow grasses and forbs and sagebrush to uh, recover. And then you have other areas um, in the southern portions of uh, management area 24, and I forgot to include 27 on this, I apologize for that, but this um, southern portion of Lincoln County and in the Clark, or yeah, Clark County um, is a transition to the Mojave Desert ecotypes. So that's an ecosystem in which fire has not been a um, significant, or how do I wanna say this? Um, fire has not occurred frequently in the past in this ecotype. So all these large fires down here um, are directly removing the resource and there's just not that natural regeneration of vegetation that we would see in other areas. So fire can uh, um, obviously reduce habitat structure from the landscape, reduce forage for wildlife, and it can also allow invasive grasses to become dominant. Um, one way to fight this is through restoration efforts. They can be beneficial for long-term um, habitat renewal in areas where uh, we can try to restore that fire by reseeding, but uh, Mother Nature has to cooperate with us. If we go through a ton of seed out on a landscape and we just don't get the rain, that restoration effort isn't going to um, be as fruitful as it would be if we did get the rain. So that's something to think about um, when we're talking about fire. Next, we're going to talk about estimated population levels for feral horses throughout Lincoln County. Um, so feral horses are, um, they, so there's uh, management areas for um, these horses on the landscape. We have herd management areas that we discuss here on the left. We have two herd management areas within Lincoln County. One of them is the Eagle Herd Management Area and the other one is the Silver King Herd Management Area. So these areas have appropriate management levels, which is what AML stands for, that have been assigned to them, which is a level of horses out on the landscape that wouldn't have um, detrimental impacts on the landscape. So for Eagle, that number has been set at 210 and for Silver King, that number has been 128. In 2020, there is estimated to be 964 horses on Eagle and 387 on Silver King. Since then, there has been uh, removals. So these numbers uh, will be lower currently than they were in 2020, but they are likely at the upper end, they're a little bit above these appropriate management levels. So one, re uh, one of several reasons why the, the horse numbers have been allowed to increase past the appropriate management levels is um, lack of funding at the federal level and lack of resources that have just made it not feasible um, to try to reduce the number of horses on the landscape and to just get maintenance removals to keep the populations at the um, levels that they need to be at um, for the appropriate management level. We also have herd areas throughout Lincoln County. 
And uh, most of the appropriate, the appropriate management levels on these herd areas is set at zero. Um, but as you can see, there are several, especially like in the Delmar Mountains, um, that are well above zero. And as we all know, in areas where horses are allowed to get out of hand, like they have um, in some of these areas, you have uh, increased utilization of the resource, which can be detrimental. For example, this photograph of the spring has been hit quite heavily by horses. You can see a lot of the area has been denuded of vegetation. The water level is likely lower than um, what it could be. So that's just one negative impact that um, excessive levels of feral horses can have on the landscape. We're next going to discuss human influences on mule deer throughout Lincoln County. So um, first and foremost, everybody knows that roadways and fences can hinder deer movement and cause mortality. Anybody that's been driving on a road in Nevada at night knows that deer are out there and they can be really hard to see. Um, so that's one impact. Uh, Lincoln County definitely doesn't have the um, roadways that other portions of the state have. Um, so we have that going for us. Um, agricultural lands can change seasonal mule deer distribution patterns and lead to land under conflict. So this map on the right, if you can see, um, all of these green areas are agricultural lands. So these um, areas, they um, can be beneficial for mule deer during certain portions of the year, especially during the winter. These agricultural fields are really beneficial for mule deer, um, but the deer are utilizing resources um, that are owned by specific landowners. So to try to compensate the landowners, we um, have the depredation program like we discussed a little bit earlier um, to try to compensate these landowners for the use. But that's just one thing to think about when we talk about mule deer in Lincoln County is um, potential conflicts that can occur with landowners. Um, another agricultural aspect is domestic livestock grazing can alter habitat availability and mule deer distribution. Um, throughout, through the past and present, that can occur um, if domestic livestock um, uh, aren't move, are getting to areas where they shouldn't be or are at higher levels um, than what is recommended. They could um, uh, alter the availability for mule deer on the landscape. Next, we're going to talk about predation. So um, obviously, predators directly remove mule deer from the population. However, there have been many studies that um, indicate predators don't typically act alone when limiting populations. So predators coupled with other limiting factors can limit mule deer populations. Those limiting factors are typically um, drought conditions, reduced forage, um, or other things. There has been some pretty cool studies out there that have shown that increased nutrition and improvement of habitat structure can mitigate the effects of predation. So there was a study um, in which a mule deer population was given supplemental food uh, during the winter. So a period which, tip, uh, which mule deer typically don't have a lot of food. And just by increasing the amount of uh, forage available to these mule deer, reduced the total amount of predation. So the, uh, they didn't touch the levels of predators at all. They just allowed the mule deer to get more better body condition and they were better able to evade predators. So that's just one thing to think about when we talk about predation as well. Um, so next we're going to talk about what has been done so far um, in Lincoln County. So the Mule Deer Enhancement Program um, isn't just uh, the Department of Wildlife saying we need to start conserving mule deer habitat. We've uh, federal partners, the Nevada Department of Wildlife, and even um, non-government agencies and private individuals have been doing a lot for mule deer um, up to this point. But we want to take a more local approach and get local people involved for a better knowledge base um, and just more cooperation so we can increase the resources available um, to help us improve mule deer habitat. So the first thing we want to discuss and what's been done so far is water developments. There have been 69 big game guzzlers constructed throughout all the management areas we've been talking about, which is um, really cool. Um, some of these in the southern portion of um, the area, some in 243 and in area 27, um, are more tailored for bighorn sheep, but a lot of these ones in the north um, are for mule deer, pronghorn, and elk. So there's been a lot done on the waterfront. 
um, habitat projects has also occurred um, pretty substantially. So these numbers we see here um, are dollars uh, provided by federal agencies, the Nevada Department of Wildlife, and even some non-government organizations um, for habitat projects. And this map on the right, these green areas are all those habitat projects. So there's been a lot of, most of these are focused around um, removing pinion and juniper encroachment. One thing that we haven't depicted here is all of the fire rehabilitation efforts that have been done. Um, so yeah, there have, been, there have been a lot of rehabilitation efforts on fire that have also been um, conducted in Lincoln County. So this is a good, yeah, this is what we've been done over the last 10 years and it's a pretty good start. Uh, we also have some future habitat projects um, planned. So uh, this uh, solid yellow area is approximately 200,000 acres that have been cleared through the NEPA process for project implementation. So not all of this 200,000 acres is available um, to implement projects on because um, as you can probably tell, this, these aren't refined project boundaries, but just within this total area, we um, projects are ready to start improving habitat for mule deer. And this um, striped yellow area is approximately 250,000 acres there. Um, some in some way inside the NEPA process and will be cleared soon for um, implementation. So in conclusion, uh, managing mule deer populations has many challenges as we've discussed, um, drought being one of many factors that we've discussed so far. Um, habitat degradation and other factors have led to reduced mule deer populations. We have done several projects. Um, when I say we, it's the big we. Everybody invested in mule deer, federal partners, state level, individuals and non-government organizations have completed projects so far. Um, and together through the uh, Lincoln County Mule Deer Enhancement Subcommittee, we can work to develop, work together to develop long-term solutions for issues facing mule deer. So this time I'll um, take any questions from members, um, subcommittee members that I guess a couple housekeeping items for the record, Dan, before we get to questions, is I noticed that Bill Brown is no longer on the phone. Um, if he's there, please correct me. And then I also noticed that Mark Holt joined the conversation or the presentation. Um, Mark, if you could please introduce yourself and uh, kind of say who you represent in this process. Uh, Mark, if you're speaking, we don't have, we can't hear you. Well, I guess with that, we'll uh, continue with questions. Thank you, Daniel. Yep. Yeah. So if any subcommittee members have any questions, you can ask those now. And if we don't have any. Um, a quick one, Daniel. Oh yeah, go for it. Uh, no, I thought it was great information. I just wonder if there's any chance you can email out a copy of that presentation so we can refer to some of that data that's in that uh, at later times. Yeah, um, I can email out to all the subcommittee members and uh, this presentation is also recorded and will be available on, I believe the Nevada Department of Wildlife's YouTube page um, for viewing. Oh, yeah. It will be um it will be posted on the website. Oh, on the website, okay. You have version. We should have the ability to, and it will be recorded and posted on YouTube. Yeah, yeah so we can get this to you, Ruben. This is uh, Cameron Boyce. I, I don't really have uh, a question so much as just <laughs> for the record a comment that uh, we 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 have been doing quite a, a few roundups. Um, we've we've got. Uh, the Eagle HMA down to um, almost AML, like you said, and Silver King. Um, however, I just wanted to point out that we're currently in litigation on all of those now as we have been for many years. Okay. Um, and yeah, just for the record, you're referring to the horse management areas of Eagle and Silver King. Yes. Correct? Yep. Yep. Thank you for that information. 
Yeah, and again, those numbers were from the 2020 year, the past year before the roundups occurred. Yep. So with that, if we don't have any additional questions from the subcommittee, um, we will, since this is a possible action item, we will open this up for public comment here in a minute. But real quick, I wanna go over kind of the next steps. Daniel, if you don't mind sharing your screen again. Oh, is it not here? Um, yeah, so first off, I really would like to, I, I'd like to thank you guys for your interest in this very important subject matter. It's, um, we think it's very important that we get um, the local individual's knowledge and use this as a collaborative effort. Next, I would um, like to go over the meal deer limiting factors ranking sheet. And then also the next slide will be how we conduct those specific projects. It's my understanding that you guys may have received a version of this limiting factor sheet already or a draft. Um, just please note that the oversight committee will be reviewing these sheets. So there's um, a chance that it will change. Um, so are you in presenter view right now, Daniel? Because we're seeing both slides, the next yeah. slide. Oops. Um, yeah, let me figure that out. Um, I apologize. Not a big deal, I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh. I think this is the one you want to see. Perfect. Um, so as you can see from this factor or this limiting factor sheet, this is just specific to area 271 is one example, but each unit will have a column and then we'll be ranking them from zero to five with where you think, like say wildfire versus pinion and juniper encroachment fits on that scale for each specific unit and management unit grouping. Um, and that will help us um, at collectively as a group help identify where the limiting factors are on the landscape for each individual unit. And I would highly encourage you, and I know that other counties such as Clark County has a vested interest in a lot of Lincoln County, and that's just one example, or White Pine County. Um, I would highly recommend a collaborative effort. This doesn't need to be in a vacuum. Um, we, we want to get the best thoughts and opinions and the, the best um, on the ground knowledge that's out there to help us inform our decision. So, um, like I said, this is just one example where it's got wildfire, pinion, juniper. It goes from everything from human impact, impacts, such as indirect impacts like fences and power lines, to direct impacts with like collisions with vehicles on roadways. So, then once we get the finalized sheet, the next steps will be um, filling out these sheets. And then um, it's my understanding we'll reconvene for another meeting and then try to decide which maybe top three or five collectively as a group, once we average the scores as a group, um, identify as limiting factors for each unit grouping and then submit those projects to the main oversight committee team and you know your top three to five and then in a sense hopefully do something like that by late summer early fall at the latest is kind of a general time frame so we should have our follow-up meeting in the in the upcoming months um and if you want to go to the next slide daniel yeah so this, um, the needs assessment pairs each one of these downs a little further to what specific ways can you achieve that goal, such as, you know, if it's conifer or if it's PJ removal um, or is it PJ restoration protection, um, you can do it either through hand thinning, lop and scatter. Um, a few important things to note is this is, we plan on this being a multi-year project. This is not a one and done project. Um, we're thinking about this in the long term. And so if one project, say, doesn't have NEPA clearance um, or if it's something that you want to start from the ground up, we do have the ability through the time frame to go through that process. Um, and so with that being said, um, we hopefully as COVID um, 
kind of wanes here, we would like to organize some different field trips in the future once um, and kind of really get to collectively talking of on the ground projects. And then also hopefully we can have some in-person meetings in the future. So with that, before we take this out to overall public comment, do you have any questions on the limiting factors sheet or the needs assessment? Joe, just one observation I've got. You know, yep. I see the rank where the ranking using the the system you got there would be good, but where we got a large chunk of ground already through the NEPA process, I mean, I think it might benefit us to go straight to those areas and try to get some projects going there and then address that. Yeah, and as I mentioned, I, I would just like everybody to go to, through the ranking process effectively. Um, I'm if Penny and Juniper encroachment say one examples ranks um, as I mentioned before the NEPA clearances and also I should mention you know different federal funds NGO funds that are already ready to go for a specific project these are all going to help the um, oversight committee's decision as a whole when trying to prioritize at a larger level. Does that help answer your question, Ruben? Yeah. So unless if there's any further questions, um, let's uh, go ahead and take this out to public comment. Okay, so we'll take uh, the next three minutes to allow anybody who wants to get public comments in to send it to uh yeah there we go to send it to the endow game at endow.org email uh again public comment needs to be sent to endow game at endow.org via email that's n-d-o-w-g-a-m-e at n-d-o-w dot o-r-g for your public comment so we'll have the next three minutes to have those come in.
So I assume that's been three minutes. Yeah. Okay, was there any public comment? So we have public comment from Mike Reese. I'll read it into the record. Um, this is a great start and I'm glad to see we are addressing the decline of mule deer. I'm looking forward to this being a multiple year program. I would like to see what the, is the estimate of the population of predators in these areas. Thank you. And that is all the public comment I am seeing at this time. Okay. So since this is a possible um, action item, please take it out to a vote or out to a motion and then a vote. Okay, yeah, so we'll take uh, the report on the mule deer enhancement program out to a motion. And I can make a motion that we accept it. So just looking for a second. I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Ruben. And now we'll take it out for a vote. So everybody for? Aye. Aye. And Mark's raising his hand too. Um, anybody against? It passes unanimously. Okay, so that takes us to agenda item number four, Daniel. So agenda item number four is public comment period. Persons wishing to speak on items not on the agenda should complete a speaker's card and uh, present it to the recording secretary. Public comment will be limited to three minutes. No action can be taken by the subcommittee at this time. Any item requiring subcommittee action may be scheduled on a future subcommittee agenda. In addition to this public comment period, Public comment, public comment limited to three minutes per speaker will also be allowed on each agenda action item, but not unless otherwise noted on reports or informational items. So does that mean we go for another three minute public comment period, Joe? Um, I believe so, yes. Okay. So again, um, anybody who wants to get your public comment in, please send an email to endowgame at endow.org. So anybody wanting to have any more public comment, email it to endowgame at endow.org. That's N-D-O-W-G-A-M-E at N-D-O-W dot O-R-G. We have three minutes to get any more public comment in.
Has it been about three minutes? Forgot to look at the time. Yeah, just a few more seconds here. Okay, cool. Was there any more public comment? I am not seeing any additional public comment. Um, that concludes our, our uh, presentation or our agenda for today for the Lincoln County Subcommittee team. Um, thank you so much for everyone's time and interest in this uh, collaborative effort. Everybody have a good evening.